in this 10th chapter, in the first six verses, it seems that Paul opens the chapter with a plea, a meek and gentle plea, if you look at verse 1 carefully. And it's a plea for help, if I understand correctly what he's asking. Now, he could be saying, uh, help me, I don't want to have to come and have this type spirit toward the church. But it seems to me that he more likely has reference to those that were accusing him of walking according to the flesh. And he asked the Corinthians, of course, they could be influenced by that and they'd need to be careful too, but asking a plea, and he uses this word begging also for help so that he wouldn't have to come in that spirit of boldness and confidence toward those he said that he intended to. Paul has admitted, if you'll notice carefully at verse 1, that yes, when he was with them in person, he was indeed lowly. And being away from them, he says, but being absent and bold toward you. So there was a difference in how he behaved when he walked among them, and I take it when he was there in person working with them, as opposed to when he would write these letters to them. And this seems to be the point of contention with those that were claiming, falsely of course, that Paul was walking according to the flesh. They misunderstood, didn't they, Paul's approach and his tactics that he used. In particular, this idea, see, of being one way, lowly, while he's with us, he's nice and meek, lowly and all. But when he's away from us, boy, he sure is awfully bold and confident and all, you see. And, of course, we know uh, the, the coward really uses that tactic, doesn't he? Uh, he'll run his mouth, you know, away from the heat and away from the action. But then when he gets in the heat of battle, see, all of a sudden he's a different person. He, he's quiet. He's got nothing to say. Real brash while away. And so it seems something along these lines is what they're trying to accuse though this mighty apostle and his fellow workers of, and that was not the case, Paul made clear. He says, though we walk in the flesh, not according to the flesh, he said, yes, we are human. Yes, God put this in an earthly vessel. Indeed, we walk in the flesh, he says, but we don't war according to the flesh. That is not how we behave. That is not the tactics that we use. He says the, the weapons, I take that to be his tactics and approaches, the Word of God. These weapons that we use, say, are not carnal. We are not hypocrites. We do not behave one way while we are uh, with you and then another way while we are away from you in the sense that we don't have the courage to stand up for what we believe in, in the sense that we don't have the courage to tell you what you need to know when you need to know it, not in those senses, although he admits that he was indeed lowly when he was with them, and then he was bold and confident while away from them. But he has a reason and both letters, I think, make this clear. And I want to detail this because I believe that's really what this 10th chapter is all about. Is this uh, carnal mindedness that some were accusing Paul of. They themselves were carnal minded. He raises the question at, chapter, at verse 7, doesn't he? Do you look at things, he says, according to the outward appearance? And then he goes on in details at verse 10 how some were indeed 
uh, carnal-minded and what they were saying about Paul and his tactics. They make a specific accusation against him along the lines that we've already discussed. But this being one way while he was away from them versus being one way when he was with them, uh, if they would uh, have read carefully these letters, uh, Paul has really explained why he was doing what he was doing. At 2 Corinthians chapter 13, at verse 10, here's what he says for starters. He didn't want to be with them and have to use sharpness. You know, it's no fun now to have to rebuke and get after people that are in sin, to confront them face to face and get on to them. Nothing uh, nice and uh, cordial and all about that. That's no fun. And matter of fact, that brings a lot of sadness and sorrow is what it does. For the, and especially the man that's having to do it, but the one on the tail end of that rebuke won't like it either. And so he explains this in this verse. He says, therefore I write these things being absent. Lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the authority which the Lord has given me for edification and not for destruction. See, I'm writing and talking like this while I'm away from you. Because if I'm with you and have to deal with this, see. So, uh, be easily to misunderstand that, but not if you understood that this man really loved this group and he did not want to have to come and uh, get after them. That the visit be about him rebuking and dealing with those because now this church still has uh, many problems. And we're going to detail these in these next three chapters. You'll see really a very sinister side. They've got people among them, false apostles, that are trying to influence this group. And there's still people there, it seems, that hadn't repented. They'd committed fornication, lewdness, or some things like that. They'd not straightened those things out yet. See, and Paul knows, now I have to deal with that. But what he does, he writes, see, and tries to get these things under control so that he could have a good visit with them, a pleasant visit, one filled with joy is what this good apostle is wanting. He says that at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, same letter. Listen to what his explanation for why I am this way while I'm away from you. Versus being with you. The way I was when y'all, when I was with you, working with you, yes, I was a certain way. And now, yes, you see this sharpness and boldness that I'm speaking with, but here's why. At the first four verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, he says this, Now I determined this within myself, that I would not come again to you in sorrow. For if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad but the one who is made sorrowful by me? And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you all, that my joy is the joy of you all, for out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly toward you or for you. So, look at his explanations are clear. Wishy-washy? No way. What This is love that's being misunderstood as wishy-washy. Oh, Paul's one way. Boy, when he writes, he, he, he's bold. And then when he's with us, he's weak. Matter of fact, look at him. Just look at how he looks. That's the charge that we'll read here, see, in verses 10 and 11. That they would make this kind of 
insinuation, see, toward the man that had started this work. So you can see uh, Paul is treading here. Yes, to write a letter and have to tell a group, uh, I've already judged that fornicator. And what I want you to do when you're gathered together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you withdraw from him. That's what he tells them. That's what he writes to them. Scaredy cat. Running his mouth bold while away from them and meek while he's with them. He's afraid. I dare you. Go to court before the unjust. Is there not a wise man among you? Who can judge among his brethren? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You see. Uh, scaredy cat. Wishy-washy. No. Love. See. Because to have to get out on the ground. This is exactly what he's talking about. To have to get out on the ground. And stand in front of this group. <laughs> and tell this fornicator. Tell those who puffed up. Tell who's going to law with their brother and to have to look brethren in the eye and say, so, no smart, y'all can't judge this matter? You're going to sue your brother? Really? Over what? See, to have to get on the ground and deal with it like that. He's trying to avoid that at all costs. And he does. His writings reflect love, this tactic, see, of using boldness while away from them. Worked, didn't it? It caused good and honest brethren to repent. They heard those words, were sorry that they had been slack in withdrawing from him. And Paul says, what zeal it produced in you, what diligence. It produced in you. And so you can see uh, how the carnal mind would uh, ascribe this scaredy cat, cowardly approach to Paul, this good man, good honest man. See, now these uh, uh, evil workers and deceitful workers that are at Corinth, apparently on the ground, they're with them, boasting in appearance boasting in how, uh, the outward appearance of things and the influence, see, that they've had on this group, and they had. In one breath, Paul would say, i got a lot of confidence in y'all, right? During the contribution issue, when he raises, he talks gently to them and encourages them to get this up and takes great steps, sends brethren there to help them get it up. No rebuke, see, outside of just reminding them, you promised this. And remember, if you don't give right, nothing good happens to you. That if you give uh, weak, slow, you begrudge it and all, God loves a cheerful giver. So he encourages them to get that up. Helps them get it up, really, doesn't he? From a distance. See? So that he don't have to get on the ground and they're embarrassed all of a sudden. Now this money isn't up. So, this is what is being carried over into this chapter. See? This, this idea of using carnal weapons, it, this is what Paul is referring to. What I just detailed is that no, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty. Did it pull down the immorality of the fornicator? That tactic of writing and rebuking them and getting after them from a distance as opposed to having to get down there on the ground and light into them? Did it work? And mighty in God, these tactics work. And this is what, but what's the accusation? Ah, uh, when he's away from us, he talks big. See? And so you can see this kind of mind that would ascribe See, that carnality to the Apostle Paul, this great love he had for this work. See, and he said, and I wrote to you, it, it 
nearly killed me to have to write that letter. See, I wrote to you and out of much anguish of heart, I wrote this. Yes, bold. Yes, confident. But you, you know, they, you have to, what's behind these writings? Love. A plea for your help. See? A begging, if you will. I don't want to have to come and be bold and confident, see, towards some that I'm going to have to deal with if I get out on the ground. And he assures them, that's exactly what I plan to do. If you look, at verse 11, Paul says this, let such a person consider this, that what we are in word by letters, when we are absent, such we will also be indeed when we are present. So Paul assures them, now don't get this twisted now, because you, yes, bold uh, when we write, but he says you better know that's how we'll be in action too when we hit the ground. See, so he clarifies this little uh, accusation, this cheap uh, shot and thoughts of his tactics and motives that he's using uh, against some, see, that, that have bad intentions, obviously, to ascribe uh, weakness and inconsistency to the Apostle Paul when all he's doing, one, he's explained clearly the reason I'm coming at you this way, I'm writing, yes, using sharpness. The reason I'm doing that, though, I, I want to have a nice visit with you. The very ones we ought to have joy when we're together. That's what we want. He delayed coming because of that. He said, I'm not coming. Uh, and so he wrote, trying to get these things straightened out trying to deal with these matters here. And again, see, at the tail end of this letter, he brings up, now, there's still some, there's still some people here hadn't straightened out their fornication and lasciviousness and things that, that need straightened out. See? And he would tell them, but let a man examine himself. See? Let each one of you examine yourselves. That's in chapter 13 at verse 5. See? So, any questions or comments leading up to where we are at this juncture? Because I believe that that's what's in play. I did want to raise the question, anybody insist, can you, uh, at that verse 1, where uh, is he saying, you know, I wrote this, uh, uh, because I don't want to have to be this way toward you, or I don't, uh, y'all help me, I, I don't want to have to come in this spirit toward those that I'm intending to come and be that I'm going to have to deal with these people. Anybody got any thoughts on that? Or any idea one way or the other? I've stated how I feel about it, but I was wanting a little feedback on that. Could you tell? Because on some levels, it, it would, uh, then what you would have, it seems to me, all the way down through here is uh, him really concerned about this, the church. I know that concern is there, but, but through this first 10 or 11 verses here, it, uh, it would really speak as if the church had really been influenced uh, to think carnally at this juncture is what it uh, would seem to me. I'd be approaching this a little different if I thought he was indeed talking to the congregation. But I think the problem was that there were some among them who were saying this, say not the entire, not the group, that there were still faithful people there. And yes, he's concerned about them, but he's really addressing this carnality that, that some were propagating there, trying to punt off on people, accusing Paul of walking according to the flesh, and he don't want to have to deal with them that way. And this, that, therefore, this plea and begging of the church for their help in this matter. Yes? I think chapter 13 kind of points towards your stance on it, because uh, chapter 13, verse 2, he 
says, I warned those who sinned before and, I, and all the others, and I warned them now while absent as I did when present on my second visit. So uh -huh. I do think he's generally speaking to the church because they've been influenced, but he's specifically trying to hammer down those who had, who had sinned. Yeah, I agree. I, and that verse weighed into my, uh, you know, the when you go through, and I think you have to to get it even what he's up here in chapter 10 talking about, to just, what is 11, 12, 13, and you can see this element is there. And, and like I said, particularly, there's people there that hadn't repented yet. See? And he does use the word some. There at verse one, you know, uh, uh, excuse me, at verse two, I beg you that when I'm present, I may not be bold with the confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walk according to the flesh. So that's kind of my rationale, but I just wanted to be careful. And if any brother had any compelling evidence otherwise that he's really aiming this at the church. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. That's a good point. You know, you always know, you normally think that uh, after him coming to church in first Christ and seeing all these problems, there's problems and still some things out there. Uh huh. Uh huh. You so really you... that, that kind of attitude behind <laughs> I hundred percent. Just yeah, it, it, and if they did, they'd be some of the first ones. <laughs> I agree with you hundred percent, Rick. That uh, the carnality you see in chapter one that he addresses, elevating men, but they also had that were guilty of envy and strife and stuff among each other. See, at each other in. Uh, chapter 3 of the first uh, chapter. So uh, this carnality, it, it don't tend to go away overnight. Even when you try to put certain things off, the devil is so crafty. Paul brings that up, see, that, that he, it, in this neck at chapter 11, his concern is that they're going to be won over by these carnal-minded false apostles, that they go influence them, get them to move off of the gospel. Oh, it'll be a a a, a good a good gospel, see, but just not the one that they had received, <laughs> just not the one that Paul named them words that had produced faith in their hearts. See, the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus, those things that Paul named laid out, but it'd be good for them. These men would tell them. And by the way, look at us. Can't look at me. I mean, look at those scrum. Look at Paul over there. You know, and look at me though. Is what they what you have going there because they make. Uh, it seems you know they said his bodily presence is weak. You know? What in the world has that got to do with with the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ? See the see the accusation, the the mind that's there. This. Uh, they're going to elevate themselves, see, by undermining the Apostle Paul's appearance. Because that's what he goes on to talk about. Here's how they roll. They, they compare uh, amongst themselves. Brother Glenn. Something I've done for, for years. And I came across this passage in Romans 12, 1 through 4. There wasn't much to Paul physically. Mm -hmm. There just wasn't nothing much to him. Mm -hmm. And it says it here. His bodily presence was weakness, his speech contempt. And when I read that, and a lot of people here remember Brother Bob Smith. Now, I'm not, uh, there wasn't much to Bob Smith physically. Mm -hmm. And when he got up and spoke, he didn't have much behind his voice. Mm -hmm. He wasn't like a, 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 a Kevin Clark would knock you off the bench. You know, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. But when Bob got up there, he spoke the truth. Mm -hmm. And I always made a point, it doesn't matter who it is, or what their physical appearance was, or what their voice carried. Mm -hmm. They're preaching the gospel. Mm -hmm. There's something to take away from that. 
and, and never to me to sit here and judge a man because, well, they just not, I'm not going to, I don't have much to listen to. They, they're just not much. There's a whole lot to that man. Not speaking of Bob. Oh, yeah. Any I, we, man that I, gets I, up there that's preaching the gospel, we better listen to him. That's what, what I took away from this. Uh, Bob. I guess I run into him on the I probably wouldn't think, well, that could be him. Yeah, let, let me clarify one thing. I agree, I agree with all that you said, the small uh, point. This is what they said. <laughs> that, ain't, that don't make it so. That's what they, they said. His speech is contemptible. Really? Paul's speech? Contemptible? So Paul's uh, bodily presence is weak? What about yours? Like, a, is yours weak? What about this? your buddy there? He, your buddy's skinny. Yeah. And the reason, the reason I say that is I really think that's uh, that judging according to appearance is each to his own. That's the truth about it. You know what I'm saying? It, and now they, they, here's some, he said, for they say. Did you notice, Glenn, that uh, Paul says for his, at verse 10, for his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech uh, contemptible. But And Paul says, let such a person consider this. Notice verse 11. Whoever says that kind of stuff, I want you to think about this. When I get there, you know that weakness you're talking about? You're going to see, a, you, you're gonna see <laughs> that boldness you said I only write about? You're going to see it in body. You're going to see it in person when I get there. See, I'll match it up for you. He says, let him consider this. Yeah. You know that because of physical infirmity, we knew that something was wrong. You may have thrown in the flesh. We don't know what that was. We have no. We have, and yeah. Take away from a man who's preaching the gospel. Yeah, because everybody in this, uh, every, who in here ain't got a got a physical infirmity. We we loaded down with physical infirmities around here. And, and uh, so what I mean is, uh, I'm not disagreeing with your point. I'm pointing out that, that this car the carnal mind, that's how it judges things, see. And Paul seems to really deal with that thought when he says, well, the way you say I am when I'm away from you, guess what? That's what you're going to face when I show up in town. Like I'm, I, I can fix that little misunderstanding you have about my attitude. I'm one way. I'm wishy-washy is what he seems to be saying. This is a, more of a rebuke than anything here toward this carnal mindedness. But you notice he raises the question for the church uh, at verse 7 when he says, do you look at things according to the outward appearance? If anyone is convinced in himself that he is Christ, let him again consider this in himself, that just as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. See, that's this, is, this outward appearance man. See, Paul says, well, look, at, okay, what, what do you, you look at things on the outward appearance? How do you, you, you're good, you think you're in Christ? And he said, well, have you considered this? If you are, we are too. See, look at us. See, that, which speaks to your point that this outward appearance is, uh, has nothing to do with a man's faith in God, a man's faith and trust in Christ, or the, the power in which he speaks. Now here is what Paul does admit, Glenn, about uh, one physical aspect that I can see uh, here. Uh, he does admit in chapter 11... Paul says at verse 6, even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge. 
See, that's what counts. That's what that's Bob Smith. See, but we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. See, Paul says we we're not behind anybody on anything, and I'm I don't consider myself at all any uh, lower than the uh, most eminent of the apostles. See, he says, oh yeah, now I'm not. Am I some uh, trained speaker or orator? Uh, no, he says, but not in knowledge. And see, we know where he got that knowledge. We know that knowledge was perfect knowledge. That He's just a mouthpiece of the Lord himself, see. So what the Corinthians got was God's word, pure and simple, uh, but from the body of, a, of an untrained speaker. Now, we got trained speakers in here, and we got untrained speakers in here. You know, men who are, to me, really good at articulating things. And then we got men here that are untrained in speech, but they do, uh, I mean, as a good a job as anybody, that's a trained speech. <laughs> that's what I, that they, you know, that, that it just works out to where it just ends up being kind of the, the man, the personality of the man. That whether you're trained in speech or not, what matters is the knowledge that you speak. And this is this issue, uh, and I wanted to emphasize that uh, throughout, so that because you can see the how you could ease, be influenced because people are. So you, you, a man gets up, and uh, in their mind, he doesn't look like much. She doesn't look like much. See, and yet you know, here's the faith of a person that really matters the most. But here is what really, to me, you know, kind of closes the door on, uh, on that whole uh, thought. Uh, I can just, uh, I think I'll just maybe just uh, quote it. You know, Jesus in Isaiah 53 <laughs> It says, you know, when we see him, he has no beauty that we should desire him. It says he has no form or comeliness. And when we, uh, and he has no beauty that we should desire. Nothing physical to it really draw us to the Lord. And you might remember in Mark, though, when he goes to his hometown, you know, they is that the carpenter's son? And the, and the Bible says they were offended at him. They, you know, they couldn't see wrap their heads around this body, this physical man, versus what these mighty works and words that he's speaking. They couldn't reconcile the two, and so they were offended. See, they couldn't get past the physical, the outward appearance. Is that not Joseph? Is they said, is that not the carpenter? Mark uh, tells us that Jesus was a carpenter. Is that not the carpenter? Is that not Mary's boy? Is his sisters not here with you know? See, all physical, but this is the Lord. This is the God of heaven <laughs> in their presence. See, and they couldn't get past uh, him because there's no beauty to draw us to him. No form or comeliness. See, no beauty that we should desire him. You wouldn't pick him. It 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 that's where he 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 picked his brother, the the pretty one. Yeah. And that's the famous God looks on God doesn't see as man sees. God looks on the heart. Which is what this is all about. See, is the heart of Paul should have been clear and evident. But that's not, is it? These, these outward appearance people look at the outward appearance and make these accusations against Paul. See? And all. Any thoughts or comments along those lines? Can't walk in his shoes on the physical side. Well, like he said, you know, are they Hebrews? Me too. Are they Israelites? Oh, me too. Are they? And then he lays out. Oh, you just want you want to talk physical. You want to look at things. He said, "Bear with me a little bit in my folly." Is what he's going to say. Let me just uh, maybe show you here a little bit what I've been through and what I've done. See, 
And, and he then gets on them for having to use that folly <laughs> later <laughs> because he says, you made me do this to the church at Corinth. <laughs> you made me have to go through all of this because see of this element that's among you that might influence you and turn you away from the gospel. But that's how he opens chapter 11. See, bear with me a little in, in my folly. I'm jealous. I'm a jealous uh, father. I'm jealous over you is how he opens that chapter. Any comments or anything? So let's go down through here and finish up. So these, he says, and we've talked about verse 11. These in verses 12 uh, down through the end of the chapter, he says, for we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who uh, commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us, a sphere which especially includes you, for we are not overextending ourselves as though our authority did not extend to you, for it was it was you to uh, excuse me. For it was to you that we came with the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things beyond measure, that is, in other men's uh, labors, but having hope that as your faith is increased, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, not to boast in another man's uh, sphere of accomplishment. But he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. For not he who commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. So, first bail. So we can see here, uh, Paul really lays out the weapons of these uh, carnal thinkers. He said, here's how they operate. <laughs> You see, now, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. they mighty. But here's what men like uh, these, uh, appear, they, they boast in appearance. Uh, they look at things, the outward appearance, say, that would make such a, a, a terrible misjudgment of the character of Paul. Say, uh, being one way in person, but when he's with us, he's like this. And to talk about his, uh, boy, look, just look at him. His bodily presence to bring that up. Paul says, they say, they brought that up. He says, you know what they do? And we're not going to go down that road. See, that's, I think that's the idea of we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. So they prop themselves up. See, their testimony is themselves. <laughs> you see, their testimony, boy, look at, Boy, he's cute. Boy, he's a good speaker. And that's that's what they were selling. See? That's what they selling at Corinth. See? And they compare themselves. What's the standard they use? Well, the brother right beside me. <laughs> you know? They measure themselves by themselves, he said. They compare themselves among themselves. Look at the standard being used versus look at Paul's standard. A man having to write a group in tears and tell them to please straighten up, to, to get on to them, to use sharpness with a group that you love so much. Nobody enjoys that. Nobody that I know enjoys having to, I mean, it's hard, isn't it? Just one-on-one -on -one with a brother that you may have to talk to or a sister. We, everybody in this room's had to deal with it. There's nothing fun about that uh, having to go and get on to somebody or encourage somebody to get straightened out. But to come in and have to deal with a group and have to get after certain ones, uh, nothing fun about that, see. But that's Paul's standard. And he met it. And he used mighty weapons to do it. God's word, uh, sharpness, rebuke. Uh, encouragement. He would send brothers ahead to help them get the collection up. What a look at that weapon. See, that would tear down 
somebody who'd accuse him of taking money out of the treasury, of traveling with this lavish gift. How does he fix it? He sends some good brethren in there. He's got faithful men traveling with him. See, hard to get past that. Hard to beat that tactic, see. Yeah, the knowledge, somebody might try it, but Paul's, boy, he's, uh, uh, what did he say? That uh, I'm providing for honest things in the sight of God and in the sight of all men. Can't beat that, see. Try that tactic on, see, of being extra careful that no one can blame you, see. And that's what he asked how he's walking among this group. But these, they, they, they're standard each other <laughs> in outward appearance. And Paul says, they, it looks to me like, can you tell that they've infringed on Paul's territory here is what it looks like. <laughs> Paul says, now we won't class ourselves with this. And he says, we however will, we however will not boast beyond measure. See, they were. But within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us, a sphere which especially includes you. Now, y'all are ours. God sent me here. You, you remember, he's in Corinth. Paul was fishing to get up out of there. Things was hot at Corinth. Jesus come to him at a vision and said, no, you stay right here. I got people here. I got many people here. And he says, and do not be, fear, uh, no one will harm you. And Paul stays and digs in and works with the group. Boy, the outward appearance is a sneaky snake, isn't it? <laughs> you see, to undermine the work of good men. Thank you all very much for your good comments and attention.